I sat in my car near the back of the parking lot, looking toward the Nordstrom storefront. It was dark out, and the store would be closing in an hour. I had my ski mask rolled up on my head. I was ready to pull it down when the time came. I clipped my wearable camera to the collar of my black, long-sleeved shirt and then pulled on my thin black gloves. The camera was small and discreet, but it wasn't completely hidden. I was concerned that someone might see it and try to take it from me. Or worse, try to hurt me for recording the coming action. An SUV rolled past slowly. I had parked nose out for a quick getaway, so I peered out the windshield, looking to see if the SUV was loaded with people dressed like me. The windows were tinted, but I thought I could see several figures hunched in the back of the vehicle. For the tenth time, I wondered how many people would show up. My heart was starting to beat harder as the clock ticked toward the designated time, 8.05 p.m. Ever since flash mob robberies had become a widespread problem, law enforcement officials across the country had been struggling to combat them. And for a little while, it worked. Not that they had much success in stopping them from happening. Then again, stopping crimes from happening isn't really what police do, although it's a common misconception. Instead, police determine ways to prosecute those who participated in the large-scale smash-and-grab style robberies. Since much of the organization for these robberies happened on social media websites, law enforcement found ways to work with social media companies in identifying the perpetrators. The whole thing about flash mob robberies was that they used overwhelming force, anywhere between 10 to 50 people flooding into a store at once, and were over before the police could respond. When they were a novel criminal act, the police had a hard time catching anyone who participated. But, as is always the case, the police adapted and changed their tactics to catch the perpetrators. After that, it wasn't long before the criminals adapted as well. Instead of organizing on social media platforms, flash mob robbery organizers turned to the dark web, where they couldn't be traced by law enforcement. At least, not yet. As a journalist, I'd been writing about the dark web for many years. I'd also been developing relationships with criminals who frequented the dark web. When one of my sources told me about this flash mob, I knew I had to take part. Not that I was planning on stealing anything. I just wanted to record the chaos up close and then write about it. It would make a great story, especially with the accompanying video footage. I already had the background, how the organizing took place on the dark web. I'd even used my source's credentials to log into the dark web forum where they discussed the details. It was fascinating. The constant battle between cops and criminals was my specialty, and I had a pretty large readership. My substack was growing nicely. It was how I made my money. But I'd never before actually participated in a criminal act. Even though I wasn't planning on stealing anything, I could still be arrested for being a part of the group. I could be charged with disturbing the peace, trespassing, or a half dozen other things. So hopefully I wouldn't be caught. I watched out my windshield as a minivan drove past and backed into an empty parking spot on the other side of the aisle. I looked at my dashboard clock. It was 8.03. Two minutes. I glanced at the minivan. The engine was still running, the headlights still on. I couldn't make out anything more than two dark figures in the front seats. 8.04, one minute. Heart thudding away, I reached up and pulled my mask down. Then I turned on the camera clipped to my shirt. I removed the key from my ignition and stepped out, pocketing the keys as I did. The minivan's doors opened and five people wearing masks, dark clothes and gloves got out. I looked at them as I stepped into the aisle. One of them nodded at me. I nodded back. Glancing up toward the entrance, I could see more than a dozen other people running up toward the store. The people from the minivan ran up, and I followed suit. The first people to reach the doors didn't wait for the rest of us. They ripped the doors open and rushed inside, but we weren't far behind. By the time I stepped into the perfumed department store, 
the place was in chaos. A couple of women were screaming. A security guard was shouting as he ran toward the mob. A robber stepped up to the guard and shot him in the face with a spray of liquid. Mace. The guard turned around and lurched away as the mob went after designer handbags, jewelry, and expensive perfumes. There was a frenetic energy among the robbers. They moved with quick steps, their heads swiveling as they peered around for threats. To make it look like I was participating, I grabbed an expensive looking purse, planning on dropping it before I left the store. As I was turning to get my camera a full view of the chaos engulfing the store, I spotted two people. They were clearly men from their builds and the way they moved. They walked with purpose down the aisles from the front doors. They didn't move with the nervous, adrenaline-fueled energy of the other robbers. They seemed to have a specific goal in mind, and they weren't rushing to get to it. Acting on some deeply ingrained instinct, I waited for them to pass before following them through the store. They didn't even glance at any of the products as they moved toward the fitting rooms in the women's clothing section. Staying back a good distance, I followed, slowing as they reached the fitting rooms. Crouching behind a clothing display, I was able to duck down as one of the men glanced over his shoulder in my direction. I didn't think he'd seen me, and a moment later, there was an electronic chime to indicate someone had gone into the dressing rooms. When I stood up again, there was no sign of the men. Unable to keep my curiosity in check, I moved closer to the fitting rooms. When I got to them, I stopped outside the entrance and listened. Wait! A man shouted from inside. Wait! I didn't know, okay? I didn't know! Please! You've been warned twice now, another voice said. You knew what would happen if you f***ed with him. Asher, that's you, isn't it? The first voice said. Please, Asher, it won't happen again. It won't. There was a muffled sound, <sighs> like a man grunting. I stepped closer, leaning through the doorway, and nearly jumped out of my skin when the motion sensor chime sounded. Jerking back from the fitting rooms, I scrambled to find cover. I slid down behind a rack of women's blouses just as the chime sounded again. I didn't dare look out but I could imagine that one of the men was standing there, peering around. Faintly, over the chaos only now dwindling in the store, I heard a man's voice say, let's go. I stood slowly and looked over the top of the clothing rack, seeing the two men headed toward the front of the store. I dropped the purse I'd grabbed, knowing that something else was going on here, something more than just a flash mob robbery. Staying low, I moved back over toward the fitting rooms and ducked inside when I thought that the men were too far away to hear the chime. At first, I didn't see anything. It was just a normal dressing room with four booths. Then a splash of color caught my eye at the farthest booth from the entrance. Blood on the floor under the dressing room door. Swallowing, I moved toward the booth. I reached out and opened the door. Oh, Jesus! Blood was splashed all over the interior of the dressing room. It dripped down the walls, puddled on the bench, and stained the full-length mirror on the inside of the door. A man in a maroon dress shirt and black slacks lay on the floor, his throat torn open. He wore a name tag above his left breast pocket that read Rick Larea. It was plain to see that he was dead. I let the door fall closed and tottered out of the dressing room area, barely noticing the chime that sounded. Then my instincts kicked in and I ran toward the front of the store, scanning for the two men. At first, I thought I was too late, that they'd left already. There were still robbers in the store, grabbing as much as they could carry, but the majority of the people had already left with their loot. Shoppers and store employees stood in shock a safe distance away, waiting for the chaos to subside. The security guard who'd been sprayed with mace was nowhere to be seen. I peered around turning three quarters of a circle before I saw the two men walking directly toward me, arms full of shoeboxes. Maybe they knew that leaving empty-handed would single them out when the police watched the security footage. Or maybe they wanted to make a few hundred bucks on top of murdering Rick Larea in the fitting rooms. Either way, I was at once terrified and relieved to see that they were still in the store. I froze, looking directly at the men, unsure what to do. The one in the lead returned my stare, looking at me with green eyes the shade of swamp water. He walked right up to me. I felt certain he was going to drop the shoeboxes and open my throat with whatever blade he had hidden on his person. 
Instead, he shouldered me out of the way without a word and walked on. The second man passed by, turning to look at me as he did. His eyes were dark brown, and I could tell by the little circle of skin around his left eye that he was sporting a rather nasty black eye. The two men walked out of the store and into the parking lot. I watched them go, standing frozen to the spot. Part of me insisted that I needed to follow them, to get their license plate, to tell the police what I'd seen, what I'd heard. But the look in the first man's eyes had scared me. It was a look I hadn't seen in anyone's eyes ever before. It was an emptiness that was so huge, so endless, that I knew it wouldn't take much to swallow me up. They were the eyes of a psychopath. I wondered if he was Asher, if he was the one who'd killed the Nordstrom employee in the fitting room. It didn't take much imagination to assume that these men had organized the flash mob for the chaos that would give them cover to commit their murder. The last of the robbers stormed past me and out the doors. I didn't realize I was the last person in the place wearing a black ski mask until someone yelled from behind. Hey, stop! I spun around hey! to see the security guard rushing toward me, his taser held out and ready to fire. His eyes were puffy and bloodshot from the mace, which was probably the only reason he missed me when he fired the taser gun. I ran out into the parking lot, booking it toward my car as tires squealed while robbers fled the scene. Pretty soon, my own car tires were screeching as I rushed out of the parking lot. Only when I got onto the main road did I slow to a reasonable speed. I ripped my mask off and tossed it into the passenger seat, breathing heavily and unable to get the image of Rick Larea's dead body out of my head. Several police cars rushed toward the mall. I watched them with intense interest in my rearview mirror, praying that they wouldn't turn around and pull me over. They didn't. It wasn't until later that I had a chance to wish they had. By the time I got to the house I shared with two roommates, I had started to wonder why I didn't stay at the store to wait for the police. I was acting on instinct, knowing that I could still be charged with taking part in the robbery, even if I hadn't taken anything. I could still be charged for other, lesser crimes, like trespassing, and trouble with the law was the last thing I needed. So as I unlocked the front door, I was thinking of a way to anonymously let the police know what I'd seen. And the first step was reviewing the video footage I'd collected during the robbery. I said hello to Aubrey, who sat in the living room eating her dinner and watching Netflix. She answered around a mouthful of burrito. Moving down the hall to the bedrooms, I passed my other roommate's room. Nate's door was open, and I glanced inside, seeing him sitting at his desk, playing a game on his computer. He had his headphones on, so I didn't bother trying to greet him. In my room, I tossed my backpack on my bed and sat down at my desk, unclipping the small camera from my shirt. I opened a desk drawer to grab the USB cord to transfer the footage to my laptop. As I powered on my computer, the doorbell rang. I whipped my head toward the hallway suddenly on edge. Although I had no real reason to be. Maybe it's the cops, I thought. But the cops didn't ring the doorbell. They knocked and yelled and demanded to be let in. Probably just a package delivery, I thought, turning back to my computer. Faintly, I heard Aubrey pause the Netflix show she was watching to answer the door. Then there was a thud, like the door swinging inward to hit the wall. And then a crash, like someone falling onto the coffee table. I got to my feet and moved to the doorway, leaning out and peering down the hall. There was a commotion, and Aubrey stumbled into the hallway before falling down, a knife sticking out of her back. A masked man stepped into the hallway after her, kneeling to finish the job. I ducked back into my room, adrenaline sending my nerves sky high. Grabbing the wearable camera from the desk, I knew exactly what had happened. At some point, They'd seen me following them. They'd seen the camera. They knew. They had followed me home from the mall. I had been so preoccupied with the cops, I hadn't even thought about anyone following me. Why would I? Like that didn't happen in real life, did it? Apparently, it did. It was happening to me, right now. Jamming the camera into my pocket, I looked around briefly for a weapon before dismissing the idea. 
I had left my phone at home so the police couldn't pinpoint it as being at the mall during the flash mob robbery. So I grabbed it off the desk and dialed Nate's number while simultaneously moving to the window that led out to the backyard. I opened the window while the phone rang. Pick up, pick up, I mumbled. When I was in the backyard, I slid the window closed and pressed my back up against the house as Nate answered. Hey dude, he said. What? You have to get out of the house now, I whispered. Go out your window right now. There was a moment of silence in which I could sense his disbelief. Are you messing with me? Nate suddenly grunted. I heard his phone fall to the floor, and then there was a sound like tearing fabric, followed by wet gurgling. Oh, I said, hanging up and dialing 911. The phone rang once before the sound was interrupted by the crashing of glass to my right. The window exploded outward, my laptop flying out and crashing into the grass. Before I could fully register what had just happened, an arm reached out through the window and grabbed for my neck. I managed to duck away from it, and the arm only caught my right hand, which had been holding my phone up to my ear. I jerked my arm away, freeing my hand but losing the phone in the process. Without looking back, I ran for the wooden fence our house shared with the property directly behind. I clambered over the fence and ran directly up onto our neighbor's back porch, slamming my palms against the sliding glass door. I could see a woman and a teenage daughter inside, watching TV. They both screamed as I hit the glass door. Help! I shouted. Help me! Let me in! The woman darted up from the couch and ran out of the room, leaving the shaking teenage girl staring at me. I tried to open the door but found it locked. Just as I was about to run around to the front of the house, a man came rushing into the living room with a shotgun in his hands. Yes! I said. Yes! They're after me! It took me a long moment to realize that the guy didn't have his shotgun out to help me. It was to hurt me. I turned to run off the porch, hoping he wouldn't shoot me in the back when I saw one of the masked men stepping onto the porch. He had a bloody knife in his right hand. It had a savagely curved blade and a hole for the finger to keep it steady as he did his work. I dodged to the left, making like I was going to run that way and jump over the side of the porch. The masked man moved quickly, juking that way. He was fast, faster than me. He closed in, not saying a word, readying the knife. In one last desperate plea, I glanced over my shoulder at the man still holding the shotgun. I could see in his eyes that he'd seen the masked man. And without speaking, I tried to convey one word to him. Help. Turning back to the masked man, I took the camera out of my pocket. Here, you can have it. I didn't see anything, didn't hear anything. I have no idea who you are. He was only a few feet away now. His green-eyed gaze felt like two needles on my skin. The blackness of his pupils seemed hungry, searching for its next victim. He shoved a lawn chair aside without moving his gaze. My back pressed up to the glass. I knew I only had one thing left to try. So I let my legs go limp, sliding down to hit the wooden porch. I fell to my side, covering my head with my hands. The glass door shattered as the man with the shotgun fired. The masked man flew back from the blast, landing on the porch steps, the knife flying from his hand. Holy <laughs> The man with the shotgun said as he stepped through the shattered window, his house slippers crunching on glass. He was going to kill you! I shot him! I f***ing shot him! I sat up, shaking little bits of glass off me, hardly believing I was alive. Jeremy? A woman screamed from inside the house. Are you okay? I'm okay! Just call 911! Jerry answered. I'm talking to them now! They're on the way! Jeremy moved toward the masked man, shotgun still held in his hands. The back porch light wasn't on, so it was dark in the backyard. Only a little bit of light came from the television in the living room. Jeremy stopped next to the masked man, looking down at him. He said, that's crazy. He turned to look over his shoulder at me. I almost shot you, man, he said. I almost, look out. I screamed a split second after noticing the other masked man emerging from the darkness at the side of the yard. Jeremy tried to get the shotgun up, but the masked man was faster. He had a knife identical to the first man's and he used it to slash the fingers of Jeremy's left hand where they held the handguard. Jeremy screamed and dropped the shotgun, turning to run away. The masked man jammed the blade into Jeremy's back. I slammed my hands against the porch in an effort to get quickly to my feet, not thinking about all the glass. Shards sliced into my hands as I got myself up and ran into the house. 
Thinking it likely that the second masked man would pick up the shotgun and shoot me in the back, I took a left out of the living room and into what I quickly saw was the kitchen. A woman screamed as I stepped into the room, rushing at me from my left. She stabbed me with a knife, sinking the blade into my left arm. Acting out of self-preservation, I reached on the counter behind me for something to use to defend myself. Still screaming, she pulled the blade out and moved to stab me again. My hand closed around something hard and cool, something made of glass. I only realized what it was as I swung it at her. The blender hit her head, the tempered glass shattering with the impact. She fell unconscious, but her momentum took her forward even as her muscles went limp. Her face smashed into the corner of the counter, her neck snapping back as she fell to the kitchen floor. The other masked man stepped into the kitchen doorway. He had the shotgun in his hands. I turned and ran out of the kitchen into the connected dining room. The man fired and the wall exploded behind me. Bolting through the dining room and into a sitting room at the front of the house, I caught a glimpse of the teenage girl who'd been sitting on the couch while I slammed into the sliding glass door just minutes ago. She was hiding behind a chair in the corner of the sitting room. When she saw me, she screamed and ran out of the room, yanking open the front door. I followed her out into the night. She glanced over her shoulder, eyes wide and wild. She clearly thought I was chasing her, and I knew anything I said wouldn't disabuse her of that notion. The important part was that she was safe. She was running away from the murderer in the house, the man with the shotgun. But as she ran toward the street, I saw the SUV coming from the right. I yelled for her to stop, but she didn't listen. She took two steps into the street before the front of the SUV smashed into her. The vehicle bumped up as it ran over her with the front left wheel. Then it came to a stop directly in front of me. I slowed, unable to believe what I'd just seen. I was vaguely aware of the window of the SUV rolling down. Finally, as alarm bells rang in the back of my mind, I looked up from the mangled remains of the teenage girl, and I saw a masked man pointing a gun at me from the driver's seat. Three of them, I thought with numb acceptance. Two killers and a driver. The gun spoke, barking into the night. I felt the structure of my body change as the bullet entered, but my brain wasn't putting it together. I looked down and lifted my shirt, seeing the hole just above my belly button. As blood seeped out of it, I sat on the concrete walkway. The man in the SUV aimed his pistol at my head, but before he could fire, two police cars tore around the corner, sirens blaring and lights flashing. He glanced in his side mirror and then hit the gas, running over the girl's body with the rear left wheel as he sped away. One of the police cars chased after him while the other one came to a stop a couple of feet from the girl's body. The cop jumped out of the cruiser and leveled his pistol over my head, yelling at someone to put the gun down. I fell back into a lying position, seeing the masked man with the shotgun upside down in my vision. I watched him raise the weapon toward the cop, and then I watched him get blown away by the officer. As the echoes of the officer's gunshots faded away, I looked up at the stars and thought about the trail of death I'd left behind me. Both my roommates and an entire family were now dead, not to mention the man in the Nordstrom, Rick Larea. It's scary how quickly things can change. When I started looking for my next story, there was no way I could have foreseen how many people would die as a result of my actions. Maybe it would have been better to just let them kill me. It would have saved at least three lives, but there was no way I could have just stood by and done nothing. No way. For all we humans think ourselves more in control than other animals, there's no overriding certain instincts. And the most ingrained of all is the instinct to survive, to keep on living no matter what, even if it leaves a trail of death and destruction behind you. But even after all that, I didn't think I was going to make it. I could feel the life seeping out of me. Then there were two paramedics kneeling over me, working to keep me alive, to save me. I smiled up at the stars overhead, Maybe I would live after all. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and smash that like button to get notified every time I upload a new video.